Which congresswomen are you talking about? They hate our country. They hate it, I think, with a passion. Dear Trump supporters, I'd like to respectfully help you dispel some of the myths that have led you to believe that the entire political left wing of this country is somehow a threat to you or your way of life. Now this is great news, because according to Pew, 38% of Americans, like myself, describe ourselves as independent, leaning left. 31% of us are Democrats, and only 26% call ourselves Republican. Now that means the majority of our country leans left. And if the majority of our country is a threat to you, then we're in big trouble. And the good news is, that's not true. We actually agree on most issues. Now let's turn to the Radical Socialist 2020 dumpster fire. But agreement doesn't sell advertising, nor elect party leaders. Fear does. Let's start with two big scare words the 1% use to divide and conquer us with fear. This socialist slash communist, okay, nobody wants to say it. Communism. It's a political theory which can mean a lot of different things, but most often it's a world where all property is publicly owned. Now, paranoia about communism infiltrating America goes back a hundred years and reached a fever pitch with Joseph McCarthy when he accused the army of possible communist infiltration. Have you no sense of decency, sir? Have long last. So this campaign, which targeted left-wingers and Hollywood, of course, as being a national threat, was finally exposed for what it was. Ridiculous. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. It's been 60 years and we're still hearing the same f***ing song. Now here's the great news. There's no Democrat in Congress, no Democrat running for president who's a communist or wants to abolish private property. Nobody. And to those who would try to impose socialism on the United States, we again deliver a very simple message. Now, socialism is a word which means basically nothing at this point. But the 1% love to make believe that the left has a singular mission to expand the federal government into controlling every aspect of our lives. Freedom versus socialism. We just need to keep saying that over and over and again. When it comes to the socialist agenda. Freedom, not socialism. Radical, extreme, socialist, democratic party. Well, the good news is there's no Democrat in Congress. There's no presidential candidate who wants to end freedom or healthy competition in the marketplace. Nobody. We're capitalists, and that's just the way it is. I believe in markets. Markets could produce a lot of value, but let me be clear. Markets without rules are theft. All right, it's pretty crazy what we want to do, so just hear me out. All we want is some basic services in return for our tax dollars, like roads and highways, traffic lights, public schools, the fire department, trash collection, electricity, water and gas, heat, parks, healthcare, or emergency services, oh, and I know, law enforcement to protect your private property. In other words, civilization, not scary. Some, like Bernie Sanders, use the term democratic socialist to make sure you still know he's talking about democracy. When I talk about democratic socialism, I'm not looking at Venezuela. I'm not looking at Cuba. I'm looking at countries like Denmark and Sweden. The powerful elite would love to convince everybody that government should not provide any services at all. And in fact, probably needs to be abolished because a completely free market would create a kind of utopian society. Now, why would they say that? because the 1% don't want to be accountable. The top 1% own more wealth than the bottom 92%. We're fighting for lower taxes, big tax cuts. And that 1%, they love those Trump tax cuts because they tossed a few crumbs to the middle class and gave the rest to the wealthy. This benefits not only the 1%, the one of 1%. And the 1%, they did not reinvest that in jobs or higher pay for regular working class folks. They kept the money, they used it to increase their wealth. We've seen this play, though, Charles. We saw this with the Bush tax cuts. We're simply going back to, to that old, tired idea. It is not geared toward the people that, that elected Trump. And that's what happens every time we don't have real representation to keep the 1% in check. My friends, you're not looking at democracy. You are looking at oligarchy, and that has got to change. When Trump attacks socialism, I am reminded again of what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, this country has socialism for the rich, rugged individualism for the poor, end quote. 
You know what else the 1% would love for us to believe? That the economy is just doing incredibly well right now. The U.S. economy grew at 4.1% last quarter. Nobody thought that was possible. Trump loves to claim credit for record unemployment rates. African American, Hispanic American, and Asian American unemployment have all reached their lowest levels ever recorded. Perhaps you remember, though, in 2016 when Trump himself called the unemployment rates a total lie. Don't believe those phony numbers when you hear 4.9 and 5 percent unemployment. The numbers probably 28, 29, as high as 35. In fact, if we had 5 percent unemployment, do you really think we'd have these gatherings? Unemployment rates have been falling since Obama and have actually slowed under Trump. You have the lowest level of unemployment in the history of our country. What? How does somebody fight that, right? Another reason unemployment rates are so low is because so many Americans have actually just left the job market completely, meaning they've given up hope and they've just stopped looking. If you include those people, then you can use the 9.9% .9 number. That 1% want you to believe that this is the best economy in history. And that way Americans can keep voting for deregulating huge corporations. We are absolutely destroying these horrible regulations. So they can keep just taking more and more. In the next few days, with broad support among Republicans and far too much support among Democrats, the Senate is on the verge of passing a bill that strips consumer protections, particularly in low-income communities. This bill will peel away vital safeguards to make sure that large banks can't crash the economy all over again. An overwhelming majority of Americans oppose this bill. Why is it that the only thing Washington can agree to do on a bipartisan basis in this Congress is to help out giant banks? Meanwhile, most regular Americans are not doing very well. The income gap between the super rich and everyone else has been growing by every major statistical measure for more than 30 years. It had been there for a long It's not as though President decades. Trump created that. They've been going for decades. Today, it's estimated that 43.5% of the total U.S. population, 140 million people, are either poor or low income. So that means nearly half the country is having trouble just making ends meet. Americans work longer hours and have more stress for less benefits than we did in the 1960s or compared to any other wealthy nation by nearly every metric. Let me read you a quote. Private capital tends to become concentrated in a few hands, partly because of competition among the capitalists and partly because technological development. The result of these developments is an oligarchy of private capital. You know who said that? Albert Einstein. So who's actually suffering from income inequality? It's not just our cities. The states that have the lowest average incomes are, of course, the red states in the South. We can start to get an understanding of why if we just briefly look over their history. These were the same states that built the American empire off the brutal slavery of Africans. Back then, slave-grown cotton accounted for over half of all the United States export earnings. At that time, the Mississippi Valley had all the millionaires. New Orleans had all the banking capital. Big banks speculated on forced plantation labor, and the slave trade was the first system of globalization. After that, the Southerners kept expanding their empire for more land to produce more cotton, wiping out the Native Americans. And the North built textile mills to exploit that cheap cotton, which led to the invention of the factory, and in turn, the Industrial Revolution. This was an economy whose bottom gear was torture and the southern elites sent their soldiers into war to keep that blood money. After the Civil War for the next century, the southern economy would still be primarily based in agriculture. And by the 1990s, the number of cotton farms in the south had fallen by half. Fabrics were now being made in factories, and technology and progress has continued to change the labor market. And those in power continue to increase their wealth without regard for the human cost. After the Civil War, one of Abraham Lincoln's staunchest warnings was about giving those with capital too much power over the working class. Lincoln said, and I quote, Corporations have been enthroned, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. 
three families control more wealth than the bottom half of our country, some 160 million Americans. Today, five most common jobs in the economy, administrative work, retail, food service, transportation, and manufacturing. And that makes up about half of all the jobs, most of which are gonna get hit hard by automation, and we are not prepared. The long, per long productivity of our society depends on science, innovation, research. And he's been slashing uh, the research budget. Long term, that is devastating. Automation could destroy as many as 73 million U.S. jobs in the next decade. We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of our country. And who are we blaming? Immigrants. Big immigration debate is underway on Capitol Hill. Preserving entry-level work opportunities for Americans is important. What we have to do is we have to wake up our fellow Americans to the fact that it is not immigrants that are causing these economic problems. It's the Amazon black hole. It's technology advancing to a point where more and more of us are going to have a harder and harder time making ends meet. So what does the left think we need to do? The left thinks we need to tax the wealthy at reasonable rates and that if we collectively bring each other up in health, and education and well-being, we're all gonna benefit from that investment. And if anyone on the left tries to even discuss this, the 1% use an age-old tactic. They divert your attention with a totally imagined enemy. Socialism with open borders is impossible. It has never worked. And that's why they've been telling you that Democrats want to open borders. No security, just let everybody in. America belongs to the rest of the world. Your job is to shut up and pay for it. Crazy Bernie, he wants to open your borders. It's a total lie. Open borders? Open no, borders. That's, a, that's a Koch brothers proposal. The really? idea that you're doing away with, with the concept of a nation state. And I don't think there's any country in the world which believes in that. What right-wing people in this country would love is an open border policy. Bring in all kinds of people who work for two or three dollars an hour. That would be great for them. I don't believe in that. There's no Democrat in government that supports open borders. Immigration does not make America weaker, it makes America stronger. Let's take Elizabeth Warren as an example, considered one of the Democrats furthest to the left. Her immigration plan, posted on her website, calls for, I quote, a cost-effective border security policy, not open borders. What Warren proposed is a nuanced legal change that removes the requirement for law enforcement to unnecessarily put illegal immigrants in detention centers. There was a cage of women, another cage of women, another cage of women. Or separate parents from their children. Magdalena pleaded for the return of her dad. But illegal immigrants could still and would still be deported. In other words, smaller government, not open borders. The only losers under a Warren plan would be the private detention centers that are making profits off of people's misery. So when Elizabeth Warren or the Congresswomen tell you the truth, that you don't need to be afraid of immigration, the 1% double down and tell you you should be afraid of the congresswomen themselves. We have freshman congresswoman Omar, who has now exposed her party's all too cozy relationship with virulent anti-Semitism. Representative Omar embodies a vile, uh, hate-filled, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel bigotry. No one in America, no one in this world should support anti-Semitism. You know, the Israeli government has a lot of policies the right wing would call socialist, for example. Israel provides universal health care, paid for by taxes. They have government subsidized free college. They have legal, often free abortion. And despite those positions being pretty unpopular with Republicans, the right wing has supported $38 billion in military aid to Israel. Now, does that mean that Republicans support abortion or prefer Hanukkah over Christmas? Of course not. The Democrats have become an anti-Israel party they become an anti-Jewish party. My father's family was wiped out by Hitler in the Holocaust. A lot of people on the left criticize Israel. Bernie Sanders, for example. I am very proud of being Jewish. Half of my ancestors are Jewish. I criticize Israel. Half of Israelis themselves disagree with their current prime minister. It's perfectly reasonable to disagree with a government policy without hating its people. But it's hard to have a reasonable conversation about that when the 1% is now telling you that liberals or the hard left sympathize with terrorists. The freshman congresswoman says she has seen an increase in direct threats against her life after President Trump tweeted a video mixing footage of the congresswoman who is Muslim giving a recent speech with footage of the 9-11 attacks. Consider for a moment that last May, the Trump administration tried to make an $8.1 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates without congressional approval. Now, I assume you remember that 15 of the 19 terrorists who attacked us on 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia and two were from the United Arab Emirates.
And we should all be clear that Saudi Arabia is a monarchy that regularly violates basic human rights and has killed at least 6,500 civilians in Yemen as of August. The airstrikes hit civilians in a raid that started at around 8 a.m. local time. People were sleeping when the airstrike targeted a residential building. And you're aware that it's against the law to practice Christianity openly in Saudi Arabia. Now, does that mean Trump supporters knowingly support terrorism or genocide or hate Christianity? I'll let you guys answer that. Trump has continued to accuse a Minnesota congresswoman of hating America. I look at Omar, I don't know, I never met her. I hear the way she talks about Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has killed many Americans. She said, you can hold your chest out. You can, when I think of America, huh? When I think of Al-Qaeda, I can hold my chest out. He's the best asset that 1%'s ever had because he just shamelessly makes up stories. The, the thing that was interesting in the class was Every time the, the, the professor said Al-Qaeda, he sort of like his shoulders went up and, you know, yeah, he's in command like, here. Al-Qaeda. Contrary to President Trump's description, Omar did not say she held her own chest out when thinking about Al-Qaeda. Of course, Ilhan has condemned terror and violence and called them evil acts. And of course, she condemns anti-Semitism while disagreeing with some Israeli policies. Asking her to condemn terrorism over and over again is exactly like asking Republicans to condemn the KKK every time they show up in public. Fuck Islam! Fuck them! Get here. Fuck Islam! God bless Donald Trump! It's also obviously in the best interests of the 1% to keep you really scared of Islam and the God that they call Allah. They don't want you to know that the Arabic word for God is Allah. Arab-speaking Christians and Jews use the word Allah if they're speaking Arabic. The word Allah was used as the name of God before Islam even existed. Jewish people. No, I love no. Jewish people. I love Christians, I love Jews, I love Muslims. Right. That's, what our, that's what our faith teaches us. How are you doing, brother? Hey, what's your name, sir? My name is Levi. Levi Osama. Pleasure to meet you. I'm the manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we all pray to the same God. Yes. And we all pray to peace, so we can all pray together. The Jew is not the enemy of the Muslims. Not at all. Things that are happening politically around the world are attached to our faith all the time. We also acknowledge that the Torah was given by the same God. In the Quran, you're going to see the same stories in the Quran that are in the Torah or in the Bible. So you don't need to fear when people use the word Allah. It just means God. It's as harmless as the word Ola which just means hello. And as far as Islam goes, the Islamic scriptures in the Quran are actually far less bloody and violent than those in the Bible. The reality is most Muslims are peaceful people who believe in God and Jesus and getting along and not judging just like most Christians. About 25% of the whole planet practices a form of Islam. That's two billion people. Let's talk about the word Islam. It's just a person who wants to surrender their ego to the guidance of the highest good. That's about the same as every other major religion on the planet. It's the same as the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's as poetic and loving a philosophy as the person who's practicing it. Every single statement that we make is from a place of extreme love for every single person in this country. And our Islamic Congresswoman, Ilhan Omar, is a normal American citizen, democratically elected, and representing Americans in Minneapolis. She's an advocate of a living wage, affordable housing, and health care, student loan debt forgiveness for all Americans. And she believes in treating all human beings as human beings. But if you think she's out to do you harm, then you'll behave irrationally. Muslim is not a religion partner. You don't come and talk about America when you're supporting Muslims. When people fear each other, they say and they do horrific things. And people in power will also say and do horrific things to get people to fear each other. So illegal immigration divides the country, it lowers wages for those who can least afford it, and in some cases, it literally costs Americans their lives. Some people call it an invasion. It's like an invasion. President, the caravan was not an invasion. It's a, it's a, a group of migrants moving up from Central America towards the border. You and I have a difference of opinion. But do you think that you demonized immigrants not in this election no, to try... How do you stop these people? You can't. There's no... That's only in the panhandle you can get away with that statement. Witnesses say the shooter passed by white and black shoppers deliberately shooting Hispanics in a city 80% Hispanic. He also posted an online manifesto embracing white supremacist views. It is a racist and 
anti-immigrant manifesto that was posted on a site known exclusively for that. People generally on this extremist forum where these people get radicalized uh, believe that there is only so much space or only so many jobs in this country and it's being replaced by uh, Mexican immigrants. Police Chief Greg Allen says he's shown no remorse. After the shooting, uh, this, this shooter is viewed as a martyr. It's a call to action. It's not simply just his beliefs on stuff. He's saying, I'm a part of a much larger thing. It should be no surprise that our director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, just told Congress that they've made 100 domestic terrorism-related arrests since October. Motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence. Uh, white supremacy is the greatest domestic terror threat in the United States of America. And that's why the majority of us are so repulsed by a mouthpiece for this. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. We're building a wall. He's a Mexican. He complained that the 15,000 Haitian immigrants who received visas in 2017 all have AIDS. In other words, diversity isn't our strength. Unity is our strength. And just as Lincoln warned us, it continues to serve the 1% to keep us divided over race and identity. Because while we're fighting, they reap all the rewards. Our country has an ugly tradition of racism and nationalism. It is literally in our DNA, and we have to face it to overcome it. God hates the hypocrite! You forgot there was a depression, and you forgot that you had to stand in line to get your food. In the 1930s, instead of Tucker Carlson, Carlson it was guys like Father, Father Charles E. I ask you in the name of Christianity, which abhors communism, in the name of patriotism, which loved America to carry it on to victory, I ask you if you will rise in your places and pledge with me to restore America to the Americans. We reached millions of people in America with each broadcast accusing Jews of manipulating financial institutions and conspiring to control the world. You know, when World War II started, in 1939, 83% of Americans were opposed to the admission of Jews fleeing Nazi Germany. Did you know Hitler himself wrote in Mein Kampf praise for America's racism and discriminatory treatment of immigrants? Now, obviously, Father Charles wasn't a real Christian any more than Trump is. And we're still fighting this dangerous idea that there's one religion or one political philosophy, or one way of life. It's not just superior, but makes some human beings have value and other human beings have no value. President Trump today retweeted anti-Muslim videos posted by the leader of a far-right extremist party in Britain. The president retweeted old, largely discredited videos. Democrats don't really care all that much about these illegal workers as much as they care about getting their power back. Now, what do I mean? For fascists to take power, there's one requirement, and that's for the masses to fear each other. When I hear people speaking about how wonderful Al-Qaeda is, when I hear people talking about... There are too many people who get their power from turning working people against working people. And if the Democrats want to rap... And this was predicted over and over again. Our first president, George Washington, warned us that political parties would be used by cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men to subvert the power of the people. Increasingly, we Americans occupy alternate universes. Democrats want to dissolve the borders. Isn't that what they wanted, open borders? The president's real troubles, again today, were not with the media, but with the facts. It's absolutely crazy. He keeps repeating ridiculous throwaway lines that are not true at all. You have, you have attracted a significantly you more influential. Well, let me finish the sentence. Let me finish the sentence I'm before listening. you do that. With all due respect, you yes, Take you have floor. you have attracted people who are determined that ideology is more important than facts. The one percent who continue to consolidate their power in this country would prefer half of us are as scared as possible of the other half under the paranoid belief that they face an existential threat from communism, a Mexican invasion, from baby killer immoral leftists, from Sharia law or a socialist government. I feel he's the last chance we have to establish law and order and preserve the culture I grew up in. If Americans really want to be safer, 
or reduce the possibility of fascist oppression, stop fearing Americans. A massacre at a Pittsburgh synagogue showed that he was railing against what he called immigrant invaders. We agree on far more than we realize, but political parties don't gain power through unity. They gain power by finding the most extreme cases of disagreement. They're called wedge issues. Abortion and guns are great examples. Most Americans agree even on those two issues, but special interests spend a lot of money for demagogues to use our worst fears to play us against each other. Is there corruption in the Democratic Party? Of course. And most of us want to root it out, especially those who don't take money from the 1%. The healthcare industry will be advertising tonight on this program. Thank you, Senator. We can't accomplish anything if you believe we're trying to destroy you. That is, as we can see, playing itself out, a truly self-fulfilling prophecy. You know we love this country. We love our cities, where most Americans live, and where most of us are so-called liberal. And we love the Midwest. And the South, where the minority of the country lives, and where most people are Republican. And in fact, high-taxed Democratic states, we subsidize low-tax Republican states in a big way. And we're happy to do it. We love this whole place. We love farmland and skyscrapers. We love our freedom taking care of each other. We value justice and forgiveness. The officer in the photo who is black is assisting a white supremacist who was overcome by heat. We respect hey, 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 rugged hey, individualism. Hey, fire! Yeah. And we love teamwork. Team all defense last year. As Jerome we love our strength. Mexican American heavy white and our country. discretion. A brave school bookkeeper talked the gunman down and then got him to give up. It's going to be all right, sweet. I just want you to know that I love you, though, okay? And I'm proud of you. That's a good thing that you've just given up. We've got a lot of issues to tackle and a lot of hurt in our history. And Kaepernick's protest against racial injustice. And players on both teams raised fists in solidarity. Get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired! But we can't overcome anything if you keep electing leaders that tear us apart. The so-called white backlash is merely a new name for an old phenomenon. I see the white backlash as a continuation of the same ambivalence and vacillation of white America on the whole question of racial justice that ex has existed uh, since the founding of our nation. Our greatest American civil rights hero, he said either we go up together or we go down together. Our survival depends on it.